Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of NASCAR's Almost Champions, Sterling Marlin. Sterling Marlin is a former NASCAR driver who competed in the NASCAR Cup Series and the Xfinity Series from 1976 through 2009. He got his start in racing when he filled in for his injured father, Cuckoo Marlin, in the NASCAR Cup Series at the Nashville Fairgrounds Speedway. Behind the wheel of the number 14 HB Cunningham Chevrolet, he started 30th and following an oil pump failure, he finished 29th. In 1978, Sterling made two more starts in the NASCAR Cup Series, finishing 9th at Charlotte in the spring, then 25th in Nashville in the summer. In 1979, he ran Nashville again in the summer for Cunningham in the number 14, finishing 15th. The 1980 NASCAR Cup Series season saw Sterling Marlin make five NASCAR Cup Series starts for three different teams. In the 1980 Daytona 500, he was behind the wheel of the H.B. Cunningham No. 14 Chevrolet, where he finished 8th. Then he made two starts in the number 5 Ultimobile for Jim Stacy Racing, finishing 11th at Darlington and 16th at Charlotte in the spring. At Nashville in the summer, Marlin got a one-off ride in the No. 40 Chevrolet for Alderk Racing, finishing 7th. He concluded his 1980 Cup Series season by making another start in the No. 14 Chevrolet for Cunningham at Charlotte finishing 36. For the 1981 Cup Series season, he again made a start for Allerk Racing, but this time in the number 99 Buick, sponsored by Coors. That's a sponsor that he would definitely end up encountering a little bit later in his Cup Series career. But he ended up racing the number 99 at Nashville, finishing 26th. Later in the 81 season, he made one start for his family Marlin Racing's number 14 Chevrolet team, at Charlotte, finishing 28th. He only made one start in the NASCAR Cup Series in 1982, behind the wheel of the number 41 Oldsmobile for Billy Matthews Racing at Charlotte, finishing 23rd. From 1980 through 1982, Sterling Marlin won the track championship at Nashville Fairground Speedway, three years in a row. Finally, in 1983, Sterling Marlin ran his first full-time NASCAR Cup Series season, behind the wheel of the number 17 Hesco Exhaust Chevrolet and Pontiacs, for Hamby Racing. His best start was 13th twice at Nashville Fairgrounds in the spring and Martinsville in the fall. His best finish was 10th at Dover in the spring. He did win the 1983 Rookie of the Year honors in the Cup Series, overall scoring one top 10 and finishing 19th in final Cup Series points. After running the full schedule in 83, for the 1984 NASCAR Cup Series season, Marlon made 14 starts for three different teams. He ran the Daytona 500 in the number 10 King's End Chevrolet for Roger Hamby, starting 40th and finishing 15th. At Rockingham in the spring, he was behind the wheel of Dick Bear's number 23 Buick, starting 20th and finishing 35th after a first lap crash. Then he made 12 starts for the Sadler Brothers Racing number 95 team, with the best start of 19th at Nashville in the summer and the best finish of 8th at Bristol in the fall. Overall, he scored two top 10s and finished 37th in Final Cup Series point standings. Marlin returned to the Sadler Brothers Racing number 95 team in 1985 to make seven starts. His best start was 10th twice at both Talladega races. His best finish was 12th at Talladega in the fall. Late in the 85 Cup Series season, he made one start in the double zero Helen Ray Special at Charlotte in the fall, starting 33rd and finishing 29th. While Sterling did not have a full-time ride in any series in 1986, in the 10 NASCAR Cup Series starts he did make behind the wheel of the number 1 Bullseye Barbecue Chevrolet owned by Haas Ellington, he really proved that he could be competitive in the Premier Series of stock car racing. His best start was 4th at Charlotte in the spring, though in 10 starts, 6 times he qualified 9th or better. His best finish was 2nd at Daytona in the summer. Also in 10 starts, he finished 9th or better 4 times. Overall, scoring 2 top 5s and 4 top 10s, finishing 36th in final NASCAR Cup Series point standings. The only reason his results weren't better were repetitive mechanical issues. Marlin also made his Xfinity Series debut in 1986 behind the wheel of a number 69 J.W. Hunt Oldsmobile for Billy Hagen at Charlotte in the spring, starting and finishing 29th. Hagen would sign Marlin to drive for him full-time in the NASCAR Cup Series in the 1987 season. Behind the wheel of the number 44 Piedmont Airlines Oldsmobile, Steve Meal would serve as the number 44 team's crew chief in 1987. Marlin's best start was fourth at Rockingham in the fall, 
and his best finish was third at Charlotte in the fall. Really, he didn't have a bad season at all, considering this was only his second full-time season in NASCAR. Overall, he scored zero poles, zero wins, four top fives, and eight top tens, finishing 11th in final Cup Series point standings. For the 1988 NASCAR Cup Series season, Marlon returned to the number 44 Piedmont Airlines Oldsmobile full-time. Sue Case Jake Elder served as the team's crew chief for the 1988 NASCAR Cup Series season. His best start was second at Talladega in the summer, and his best finish was second at Martinsville in the spring. The team spent every single week inside the top 10 in point standings, even spent 12 weeks inside the top 5 in point standings. Overall, he scored 0 poles, 0 wins, 6 top 5s, and 13 top 10s, finishing 10th in final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, Marlon made four starts, also in the number 44 Piedmont Airlines Oldsmobile for Billy Hagen. His best start was 5th at Richmond in the fall, and his best finish was 11th at Charlotte in the spring. In 1989, Marlon again returned to the Hagen Racing team, though they changed their number from 14 to 94, to go with their new primary sponsor, Sunoco Ultra 94 Octane. His best start was 4th at Martinsville in the fall, and his best finish was 2nd at Charlotte in the spring. Daryl Bryant served as Marlins crew chief for the 1989 Cup Series season. Again, the team had a pretty solid season, spending six weeks inside the top five in points, and 17 weeks inside the top ten in point standings. Overall, he scored zero poles, zero wins, four top fives, and 13 top tens, finishing 12th in final point standings in the Cup Series. In the Xfinity Series, he made two starts, both for Hagen Racing and a number 48 Oldsmobile. His best start was third, and his best finish was 25th, both coming at Charlotte in the fall. A new decade, 1990. But for Marlin, he remained in the same number 94 Sunoco Oldsmobile ride for Billy Hagen. Steve Lloyd served as Marlin's crew chief for the 1990 NASCAR Cup Series season. His best start was third at North Wilkesboro in the fall. His best finish was third at Talladega in the summer. The team in Marlin was not quite as consistent as the previous couple seasons, though it wasn't a bad season still by any means. Overall, scoring zero poles, zero wins, five top fives, and ten top tens, finishing 14th in Final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, he made five starts in Fred Turner Racing's number 48 Oldsmobile. His best start was fourth at Charlotte in the spring, and his best finish was first at Charlotte in the fall. This was his first career Xfinity Series victory. Overall, scoring zero poles, one win, two top fives, and two top tens. After spending the last five seasons driving for Hagen Racing, Sterling Marlin landed a new ride in the NASCAR Cup Series for the 1991 season. Behind the wheel of the number 22 Maxwell House Coffee Ford for Junior Johnson and Associates. Mike Beam served as Marlin's crew chief for the 1992 Cup Series season. His best start was first twice at Daytona and Talladega in the summer. This being his first two poles of his career. His best finish was second twice at Daytona in the spring in Bristol in the fall. Marlon was very consistent, spending three weeks inside the top five in points and 22 weeks inside the top ten. Overall, scoring two poles, zero wins, seven top fives, and 16 top tens, finishing seventh in final Cup Series point standings. Marlon returned to the Junior Johnson & Associates number 22 Maxwell Hells Coffee Ford full-time in 1992. His best start was first five times. Both races at Daytona and Arlington then Talladega in the summer. And his best finish was second twice at Daytona and Talladega in the summer. This season, again, was pretty solid for Marlon, overall scoring five poles, zero wins, six top fives, and 13 top tens, finishing 10th in final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, he made two starts for Fred Turner Racing in their number 10 Maxwell Hells Coffee Chevrolet. His best start was seventh at Daytona in the spring, and his best finish was fourth at Charlotte in the spring. At the conclusion of the 1992 NASCAR Cup Series season, Marlon decided to leave Junior Johnson & Associates due to the fact Johnson had not even discussed re-signing him to drive the number 22 Ford for the 1993 season. In 1993, Marlon joined the Stabola Brothers Racing No. 8 Ray Bestis Brakes Ford team, full-time in the NASCAR Cup Series. Ken Wilson served as Marlon's crew chief for the 1993 Cup Series season. His best start was second at Loudoun in the summer, and his best finish was second at at Daytona in the summer. In comparison with his previous several seasons, this was a down season, overall scoring zero poles, zero wins, one top five, and eight top tens, finishing 15th in final Cup Series point standings. 
In the Xfinity Series, Marlon made eight starts for Fred Turner Racing's number 48 and number 70 Fords. His best start was 11th at Darlington in the fall, and his best finish was 5th at Atlanta in the fall. Overall, in eight starts, he scored one top five and two top tens. At the conclusion of the 1993 season, Marlon and the Stabola brothers parted ways. The 1994 NASCAR Cup Series season saw Sterling Marlin get signed to drive the number four Kodak Film Chevrolet full-time for Morgan McClure Motorsports. Tony Glover served as Marlin's crew chief starting in 1994. After 18 seasons of trying to win a NASCAR Cup Series race, Marlin won the biggest race of them all, the Daytona 500. His best start was first at Phoenix in the fall. He led the points for two weeks. He was in the top five for three weeks and in the top ten for ten weeks. Overall, he scored one pole, one win, five top fives, and 11 top tens, finishing 14th in final Cup Series point standings. Then in the Xfinity Series, Marlon made nine starts in Fred Turner Racing's number four Kodak Fun Saber Chevrolet. His best start was second, and his best finish was fourth, both coming at Talladega in the summer, overall scoring one top five and three top tens. The following season, in 1995, Sterling Marlin returned to the Morgan McClure Motorsports number 4 Kodak Film Chevrolet full-time. This was by far the best season in Marlin's NASCAR career thus far. For the second year in a row, he won the Daytona 500, having a very distinct sound to their engine, almost sounding like an open-wheel car. Though, that was not the only bright spot of this season. His year was filled with bright spots. His best start was first at Talladega in the summer. His best finish was first three times at Daytona and Darlington in the spring, then Talladega in the summer. He spent every single week inside the top five in point standings, even leading the points for three weeks. Overall, scoring one pole, three wins, nine top fives, and 22 top tens, finishing third in final Cup Series point standings. Definitely one of the reasons he fell into the NASCAR's Almost Champion Series category. Marlin only made one Xfinity Series start in 1995 at Nashville Fairgrounds for Fred Turner Racing's number 2 Delco Battery Chevrolet. Starting 7th and finishing 36th after an issue with his brakes ended his race around lap 140. Following his career best season in 1996, Marlin returned to the number 4 Kodak Film Chevrolet full time. His best start was 2nd at Daytona in the summer and his best finish was 1st twice at Talladega in the spring and Daytona in the summer. After a bit of a slow start to the 96 season, Marlin and the number 4 team had another competitive solid season, spending 25 weeks inside the top 10 in point standings, 6 weeks inside the top 5. Overall scoring 0 poles, 2 wins, 5 top 5s, and 10 top 10s, finishing a solid 8th in final Cup Series point standings. Marlin made 2 Xfinity Series starts for 2 different teams. His best start was first at Nashville Fairgrounds in the spring, behind the wheel of the number 22 Pontiac for Fred Turner Racing. His best finish was third at Charlotte in the fall, behind the wheel of Mac Martin's number 92 Chevrolet. Like all good things, the Sterling Marlin and Morgan McClure Motorsports partnership ended at the conclusion of the 1997 NASCAR Cup Series season. Tim Brewer started the season as Marlin's crew chief, but starting at race 15 in California, Robert Larkins replaced Brewer as Marlin's crew chief. Sterling's best start was second at Bristol in the spring, and his best finish was third at Daytona in the summer. The results really fell off for Marlin in the number four team in 1997. Overall, he scored zero poles, zero wins, two top fives, and six top tens, finishing a disappointing 25th in final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, Marlin made three starts, two for the number 92 Chevrolet, owned by Mac Martin, then one in the number four Chevrolet, owned by James Finch. His best start was 12th, and his best finish was 17th, both coming at Charlotte in the spring. Felix Sabat has signed Sterling Marlin to become the new driver of the number 40 Coors Light Chevrolet full-time for his Team Sabco Cup Series team, starting in 1998 in the NASCAR Cup Series. The team switched crew chiefs a couple times before settling on Corey Stott as the team's permanent crew chief for the 1998 Cup Series season, starting at race 8 in Martinsville. Marlin did DNQ for the spring race in Atlanta. His best start was third twice at Daytona and Richmond in the spring. And his best finish was seventh twice at Sonoma and Watkins Glen in the summer. Really, for the first season together, they had a solid season. Overall, scoring zero poles, zero wins, zero top fives, and six top tens, finishing 13th in final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, Marlin formed his own 
team, making five starts in his number one Rayovac Chevrolet. His best start was 13th at Talladega in the spring, and his best finish was 7th at Nashville Fairgrounds in the spring. Then, in 1999, Marlon would return to the Coors Light number 40 Chevrolet, full-time for Team Sabco. Corey Stott was replaced by Scott Eggleston as his crew chief, starting at race 13 at Dover. Marlon's best start was 1st at Pocono in the spring, and his best finish was 4th twice at Pocono in the spring and Richmond in the fall. The 1999 season was pretty close results-wise to the season prior. Overall, he scored one pole, zero wins, two top fives, and five top tens, finishing 16th in final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, Marlon attempted 10 races, making seven starts, making three attempts in a number 42 Circuit City Pontiac for Joe Gibbs Racing, only qualifying for the Las Vegas Spring Race, starting 26th and finishing 33rd. He made seven attempts in his own Marlin Racing number 14, University of Tennessee and Track Phone Chevrolet. His best start was second twice at Nashville in the spring, then Michigan in the fall. His best finish was fourth at Bristol in the fall. Overall, in seven starts, he scored one top five and three top tens. A brand new century, the year 2000. Though for Sterling Marlin, things remained pretty much the same. He returned to the number 40 Coors Light Chevrolet full-time for Team Sabco. His best start was third at Loudoun in the summer, and his best finish was second at Sonoma in the summer. Once again, Marlon's stats looked very similar to the previous couple seasons, spending the entire 2000 Cup Series season between 14th and 20th in point standings. Overall, he scored zero poles, zero wins, one top five, and seven top tens, finishing 19th in final Cup Series point standings. With Dodge making their return to the NASCAR Cup Series in 2001, and Chip Ganassi purchasing majority ownership, of Team Sabco for the 2001 season. Sterling Marlin was about the only thing that didn't change on that number 40 Coors Light, now Dodge team. Marlin was battling Dale Earnhardt for third position on the final lap of the Daytona 500 with two Earnhardt Incorporated cars, first and second. Earnhardt was trying to block when he Sadly, two got together, resulting in Earnhardt losing control. Everyone knows it was simply a racing accident. A horrible, tragic accident. Some fans were negative towards Sterling Marlin following this, and I don't agree with that. Not at all. It was just really honestly an accident. Anyways, Sterling went on to have the rebound year of the ages. Lee McCall served as his crew chief starting in 2001. Marlon's best start was first at Daytona in the summer, and his best finish was first twice at Michigan and Charlotte in the fall. Marlon was able to finally get back to victory lane after not winning for four seasons. He led the points for one week. He was in the top five in point standings for 33 weeks and in the top ten for every single week of the 2001 NASCAR Cup Series season. Overall, he scored one pole, two wins, 12 top fives, and 20 top tens, finishing third in final Cup Series point standings. He did not run any Xfinity Series races in the next few seasons. This season is another reason that Marlon falls under the NASCAR is almost Champions Series category. The 2002 NASCAR Cup Series season is the final reason that he falls into this category. Marlon returned to the number 40 Coors Light Dodge full-time. Marlon was having the very best season of his career, leading the Cup Series point standings, for 25 weeks. At race 29 in Kansas, Marlon had a hard crash on lap 147. He suffered a cracked vertebrae. In 29 starts, his best start was first twice at Pocono in the spring, then Darlington in the fall. His best finish was first twice at Las Vegas and Darlington in the spring. The Darlington race would end up being Marlon's final Cup Series victory of his career. Overall, he scored two poles, two wins, eight top fives, and 14 top tens, finishing 18th in final Cup Series point standings. That following season, in 2003, Sterling Marlin returned to the Chip Ganassi Racing number 40 Coors Light Dodge full-time. His best start was fourth three times at Rockingham in the spring, Daytona in the summer, then Talladega in the fall. His best finish was sixth four times at Bristol, Talladega, Pocono, and Michigan in the spring. This season, Marlin spent seven weeks inside the top ten in Cup Series point standings. 
Overall, he scored zero poles, zero wins, zero top fives, and 11 top tens, finishing 18th in final Cup Series point standings. By the time the 2004 NASCAR Cup Series season had come, Marlin and the number 40 team's momentum that they had built up over the 2001 and 2002 seasons had all but disappeared. As a matter of fact, Tony Glover replaced Lee McCall as Marlin's crew chief, starting at race 31 in Charlotte. His best start was third at Bristol in the fall, and his best finish was fourth three times at Rockingham and Bristol in the spring, then Martinsville in the fall. Marlin only spent one week inside the top ten in Cup Series point standings all season. This was the beginning of the final statistical decline of his career over the next few seasons. Overall, scoring zero poles, zero wins, three top fives, and seven top tens, finishing 21st in final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, Marlin returned to make two starts for James Finch's number one Dodge team. His best start was 26th at California in the fall, and his best finish was 21st at Charlotte in the fall. Sterling Marlin returned to the number 40 Cooper's Light Dodge for the final season in 2005. Steve Boyer served as Marlin's crew chief for the 2005 NASCAR Cup Series season. His best start was 7th at Darlington in the spring, and his best finish was 5th at Texas in the spring. Marlin did spend four weeks in the top ten in point standings early in the season, though he fell like a rock as the season progressed. Overall, he scored zero poles, zero wins, one top five, and five top tens, finishing 30th in final Cup Series point standings. In the Xfinity Series, he made 19 starts behind the wheel of a number 40, Jana King, Family Dollar Dodge for Armando Fitz. His best start was fourth at Darlington in the spring, and his best finish was second at Charlotte in the spring. Overall, in 19 starts, he scored zero poles, zero wins, three top fives, and five top tens, finishing 24th in final Xfinity Series point standings. In 2006, Marlin joined MB2 Motorsports to start driving the number 14 Waste Management Chevrolet full-time. At race 21 in Indianapolis, land developer Bobby Ginn bought MB2 Motorsports. Doug Randolph started the season in bar as Marlin's crew chief, until race 16 at Sonoma, where he was replaced by Scott Eggleston. Marlin's best start was 6th at Martinsville in the spring, and his best finish was ninth at Richmond in the spring. Marlin did qualify for every race, and still remained in the 30s the entire season in point standings. Overall, scoring one top 10, finishing 34th in Final Cup Series points. Things did not improve in 2007 at all. Marlin did return to the number 14 Chevrolet for Gen Racing, for what was intended to be a full-time effort. Slugger Labby served as Marlins crew chief for the 2007 NASCAR Cup Series season. Following race 19 in Chicagoland, Gin Racing shut down the number 14 team due to sponsorship issues. His best start was 4th at Talladega in the spring, and his best finish was 13th at Darlington in the spring. When the number 14 team stopped coming to the track, he was 29th in Cup Series point standings. Marlin made the final two starts of the season, driving the number 09 Mikasuki Resorts Chevrolet for James Finch. His best start was 16th at Homestead in the fall, and his best finish was 25th at Phoenix in the fall. In the Xfinity Series, he made two starts, both for James Finch's number 1 Mikasuki Resorts Chevrolet team. His best start was 7th at Memphis in the fall, and his best finish was 15th at Dover in the fall. Then in 2008, Marlon attempted 12 races, making nine starts for two different teams. After a more than two-season hiatus, Marlin reunited with the number 40 Dodge team owned by Chip Ganassi Racing for two starts. His best start was 14th at Darlington in the spring, and his best finish was 31st at Charlotte in the spring. Then he made seven starts behind the wheel of James Finch's number 09 Mikasuki Resorts Chevrolet. His best start was 16th, and his best finish was 22nd, both coming at Talladega in the spring. In the Xfinity Series, Marlon made his final career start at Nashville Super Speedway for James Finch's number one Mikasuki Resort Chevrolet, starting 20th and finishing 22nd. Finally, in 2009, Sterling Marlin wrapped up his NASCAR career by making the final seven Cup Series starts of his career behind the wheel of James Finch's number 09 Mikasuki Resort Chevrolet. His best start was 36th twice at both Pocono races, and his best finish was 35th at Martinsville in the fall. So, in 748 NASCAR Cup Series starts, he scored 13 poles, 10 wins, 83 top fives, and 216 top tens, with the best points finish a third twice in 1995 and 2001. 
in 77 Xfinity Series starts, he scored one pole, two wins, 12 top fives, and 22 top tens, with a best points finish of 29th in 2005. Thank you for watching, everyone, and take care.